Hey, hey, hey. Welcome back, everybody. Another episode of the Can We Please Talk podcast. As always, I'm Mike Leon. And looking so fresh and so clean, clean. It's Nick oh, Severo. come on with oh, that on. intro. All right, there we'll we keep go. it. I'm not going to cut it Here, out. You got to keep that. <laughs> yeah. How's every, how you doing over there, Nick? Obviously, you are looking a little bit more dapper here. For the people that are watching on video can see it. The audio people, I'm sorry. You're not going to be able to see Nick in a stunning blazer. Uh, how are you, my friend? But they'll be able to feel it, though. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm good. I'm good, man. We are almost a week away from vaccine number two. That's right. Uh, That's right. And also my parents coming over finally, you know, get a chance to see the house and catch up with their grandbabies, which I know what they want. Uh, right. But no, things are good here, man. Looking forward to looking forward to all that. And it's been a busy week, busy week at work. Yeah. And just looking forward to Friday can't come soon enough. Right, right, right. For those of people listening and watching, you know, we we record once a week. Uh, so, you know, obviously this this episode is taping on a Thursday. We just um, cut this. Right. No, no, we're going to keep it now, Nick. Now I'm not going to cut it. <laughs> but um, but actually, you know, we um, we we had our recent episode. We had a news correspondent on Mike Emanuel from Fox News. Right. And unfortunately, before we had Mike on. Um, in the subsequent days, there was the mass shootings in Atlanta, Georgia, and in Boulder, Colorado. Um, unfortunate, our hearts go out to everybody and all the lives lost in that. And, you know, we, we wanted to get somebody on to really help us, you know, kind of digest all of the legal news that's going out there. You know, there's the jury trial in the George Floyd murder case uh, with the police officer, Derek Chauvin. Um, there's lawsuits that have been happening in the uh, big tech world, you know, Parler suing Amazon. There's been legal news coming out of Sidney Powell, you know, saying that some of the stuff that she said during the election cycle was not true in the court of law. She said this. Um, so there's so much legal news. And then obviously what happened on January 6th and the arrests that have come forward from the, the riot in the Capitol. So we wanted to get somebody on to really help us break down all of this from the legal perspective. And so Ellie Honig is going to be joining us tonight. He's a former federal prosecutor for the Southern District of New York. He's a CNN legal analyst right now. And he also hosts what I think is a great podcast. It's called Third Degree Podcast. You can check it out available wherever you get your podcast. And in that podcast, Ellie really breaks down the legal news of the week on Mondays and Wednesdays. And then once a week, he has on uh, five of the top law students to kind of go over some of the legal debriefs that are going on around the country. So Ellie is uh, is fantastic. Obviously, uh, his work in, in the legal community uh, is unmatched, you know, and uh, he's a Rutgers guy like you and I, Nick. Uh, we keep finding these Rutgers guests <laughs> accidentally. Uh, <laughs> so kudos to him for that. But um, all of the stuff that's been going on in the, in the news cycle, um, you know, it's it's really it's disheartening, man, and everything that's been going on. And we always get back to this same place, right, especially with the shootings that happened in Atlanta and, and in Colorado. Uh, gun control, gun reform. What does that look like, you know, from a legislative perspective? And then the flip side of it is people are going to want justice, right? And these two uh, men to be held accountable for their actions. And so what does that look like from a prosecutorial lens? And that's where Ellie's going to really help us tonight. Um, Nick, it's a tough segue, I, you know, and transition to you. Normally, I have something good to tell you here. But the recent news, man, has just been, you know, um, it's been tough, man. It's really been tough. And you can hear it in my voice a little bit. And, and it sucks because we, we seem like we always end up right back here with another mass shooting that's taking place in this country. Yeah, it's a it, it it's tough to even say epidemic um, because it seems more consistent than that for us as a country. Gun violence is is pervasive. It's something mm -hmm. that is ongoing, uh, and we far and away lead the world in incidents like this. Uh, we, we as a country really struggle with having any meaningful gun reform. Uh, I know recently, um, obviously, it's right now fifty fifty split in in the Senate. Um, West Virginia uh, uh, Senator Joe Manchin has already come out and said he's not going to support universal background checks, and it makes the hard it makes the job harder. Uh, on the flip side, President Biden is talking about moving forward with executive action, which we didn't see uh, President Obama um, look uh, move forward with after the after the shootings at Sandy Hook. You know, Mike, over the past year, our biggest focus, rightfully so, as a nation, was on the pandemic. 
and getting to the point where we are now, where I obviously, you know, talked about my, my vaccine coming up and, um, and for, you know, for everyone that we know who's getting vaccinated and trying to get back to that sense of normalcy. But unfortunately in the United States of America, that sense of normalcy oftentimes involves gun related violence. And that's mm-hmm. what we saw recently with the shootings in Atlanta, which are a hate crime. I don't know if there's any debate to that at this point, nor should there be. Uh, and then the recent shooting in Boulder. Um, you know, again, we you can you can list the number of places in the U.S. where you should feel a whole lot safer from gun violence, but that's not the case. And Colorado particularly stands out because you think about Boulder, you think in 2012 about the shooting in Aurora at the movie theater at the premiere uh, of the Batman film. Uh, and most famously in Colorado, you think of the incident in 1999 at Littleton, Colorado, at the at the shooting at Columbine High School. So the state of Colorado, like other states we've seen, continue to struggle with, with the conversation around gun reform. Uh, and I think tonight's conversation isn't so much about getting into gun reform and you know, the ways and means about it, but more about what is this conversation looking like at a national standpoint? You know, what do we at from a prosecutor, prosec, well, prosecutorial standpoint? Tough word. Yeah, I know you got me. Uh, from that legal standpoint, what what can be done? What makes these recent cases unique? Um, I think there's a lot of things that Ellie brings to that conversation today. But yeah, like you, Mike, I come at this from a heavy heart because, you know, good news is on the horizon with the vaccine and obviously the country being able to, you know, return to form. Um, but return to form can't be the inclusion of gun violence. And then it seems to be that way. And that's kind of where we are right now. Yeah, you know, it, it's it's a tough thing. You know, I'm watching today um, some not only President Biden's press conference that took place today, again, at the time of our taping, um, he, you know, he was giving his press conference today. But then you see some other lawmakers on on the right and left. Like you mentioned, look, Joe Manchin not supporting universal background checks. Ted Cruz, you know, coming out with with rhetoric that is, again, kind of stirring up the base of the Republican Party that really believes that the left wants to take away guns, right? Whereas the people on the left want to have a civil conversation about actual gun reform to not take your gun away, not the responsible gun owner, but the person that, you know, could have mental illness, longer uh, wait lists for people at gun shows, background checks, And we always just, we drive around in circles in this country. And unfortunately it's to the detriment of this country because, you know, two more mass shootings that happen, you know, over a 10 day span. And it's tough. Like I said, this is not really a gun reform episode, but you know, you you really can't get around that conversation um, from a, from a legal perspective. And, And that's why I'm glad Ellie's coming on tonight to try to make sense of it because, you know, he's, he's entrusted with, you know, um, prosecuting people to the full extent of the law, right? He's not really on the side of lawmakers and and what can be done, but I'm sure it's gotta be frustrating at some point uh, from his lens to see, hey, we could easily enact this and we're not doing it. And then the other problem is, you know, Nick, you didn't even touch on this, but it's 50 different countries operating in one country here in the US. It's 50 different states that have 50 different open carry laws. You know, in Florida, it's open carry. In Georgia, it's open carry. In New York, it's not. You know, Colorado has a different statute. And so you get into the weeds of, you know, what can legally be done to possess a gun? What what does the background checks look like? And that's why Ellie's going to help us to, today make sense of all of that. And we're just excited to have him on. Can't wait to talk to him. All right, Nick, like we talked about at the top, our guest tonight is a former federal prosecutor, current CNN legal analyst, the host of Third Degree, one of my favorite podcasts. But more importantly, Nick, he's a Rutgers man, just like you and I. And that is Ellie Honig. Ellie, Mike Leon, Nick Saveri, thank you so much for hopping on with us today, my friend. Mike, Nick, I'm feeling the Rutgers love. I'm feeling the Jersey love. How are we feeling? How are we feeling? I just want to know. Were you guys as crushed as I was by that sweet six? Well, I can't know almost sweet 16 game. (laughs) We should be in the sweet 16 right now. I I am am so crushed about it. Um, You know, I've been going to games in 98. I went to my first game in high school 
and it made me want to go to Rutgers. They beat Rob Syracuse. Hodgson, Jeff Billet. That's right. That it was that game where he was bleeding on the shirt. Sure. He had to change his jersey. Yep. Yep. Uh, th- this is great, fantastic conversation. Our audience is gonna love this. But yeah, uh, right, but, right. You know, but but that game really. Uh, I told my dad right after that. I was like, I want to go there, and he goes, We haven't even looked it up. You haven't even. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I want. I don't care. I want to go there. But yeah, I, I was heartbroken. It. I love it. Well, good. It, listen, I, 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 this will be the last thing I'll say about Rutgers. Know that the kids on that team, the young men on that team are a fantastic group of young men. I teach at Rutgers now. I, I, you know, I don't know them personally, but I know them by reputation. And Mm. they're all just good students and good kids from good families. And they're going to be successful in life and they're going to be successful in basketball still. That's great to hear. Yeah, Yeah. for sure. They're going to have a lot of choices for next year's team as to who's coming back and not. For sure. Um, as we transition, Ellie, you know, we mentioned you're a former federal prosecutor. We want to get into some of the news that's been happening around the docket, as I like to say. Um, some tough news, obviously, what's been happening with the mass shootings in Atlanta and Boulder. I want to go into each one individually and give our audience a little bit of a sense of an update as to what is happening in both cases. So obviously both men are under custody right now. Take us to a little bit of in the Atlanta case and in the Boulder case, uh, what's currently happening at this moment uh, in yeah. both cases. Yeah, both obviously sort of, uh, you know, anyone's worst nightmare and really the most important thing that you can ever be called on to do as a prosecutor or in law enforcement. So in Georgia, the Atlanta shooting, the individual is now charged with eight counts of murder because he shot and killed eight different women. Um, None of these guys, by the way, neither of these guys is ever going to live a day outside of jail or other psychiatric custody, which I'll talk about. The question now for me in the Georgia case is, will we see hate crime charges added on to those murder charges? Under Georgia state law, you can tack on a hate crimes charge. It's an extra penalty. It can be anywhere from two years up additional to whatever the underlying crime is. In this case, it would be a murder. You know, there's a little bit of of um, a lack of clarity about whether that will happen. First of all, some people I think say, well, why? I mean, you know, murder is going to be life. This guy's going to do eight life sentences. Why do we need hate crimes charges? Um, and my answer, I think, is because there's a societal judgment attached to that. We we passed hate crimes laws. We collectively as a democracy in, in virtually every state because we want to make a statement, because we believe that it is worse to kill somebody or to commit a crime against somebody because of their race, ethnicity, uh, national origin, sex, or gender. And the interesting thing is Georgia didn't even have a state hate crimes law until last year, 2020. They passed it only shortly after the murder of Ahmaud Arbery. That trial is coming up. This is the young black man who was jogging. We've all seen the horrible video when he gets gunned down. That prompted the political momentum to finally, they became one of the last states in the union to pass a hate crimes law. What's interesting to me is the cops have come out and said, well, he said he had a sex addiction. And a lot of people seem to be concluding, well, then not a hate crime. I uh, I respectfully disagree. I don't know that it is a hate crime, but here's what I say to that. Number one, how about we do a little more work than just asking the guy, right? Like defendants give BS self-serving stories all the time. I was a prosecutor for 14 years. Do your investigation. Look at his social media. Talk to his friends. And let me say this. Let's just do the math on this. He had eight victims. Six of them were Asian women. If you just went into the population in general and they weren't all in one place, they were in three locations. What are the odds you would just happen to hit six Asian women? They're astronomical. So to me, there's some planning, some design, some targeting there. The other thing is under Georgia law, if you target women because they're women, that qualifies to 78, vic- seven of the eight victims here were women. So I think prosecutors, I'm not satisfied with this sort of glib ah, sex addiction, no hate crimes. I-, I don't quite buy that. I think they have a lot more work to do. And I think they, that it is important that they bring the hate crimes charges if they're there. Does it feel like a preliminary effort by the police to try to de-emphasize this for any particular reason? I, I took it as unusual that they would come out and give essentially his alibi, not his alibi for doing the the murder. But why would you put that out there? Why would you put his self-serving statement out there in the public? It's not a common thing for police to do. I'm not saying the cops are trying to sabotage the case, but I'm saying I think they want to maybe just undermine this notion that he was fueled by, uh, you know, a, a hatred for Asian Americans or for women. But I don't know why. I don't know why they would do that. Um, Look, 
you don't come out, just picture any normal case. You know, what if it was a terrorism case and the person blew up a building, a foreign terrorism case, and the person said, I did it because it's my religious beliefs and I believe the, uh, that America is horrible. Would you get out in front of the cameras as a cop and repeat that and go, well, let me let me tell everybody why he said he did it. I, I, that's not normal procedure to me, and, and it's not a great idea, and, and, and I'm not sure what's behind it. Well, let's get into the Boulder case, because yeah. like you just mentioned, um, I, I want to get into the specifics of the case, but then you, you touched on something there at the beginning. Mm-hmm. It's very tough. I was mentioning this before you came on. We have 50 different countries in this country. We have 50 <laughs> states that have their yeah. own set of laws, you know, and some states are open carry, some states are not. You yeah. know, how tough is that from a federal prosecution level? So I would love for you to just get into the details of the Colorado case and then on the secondary part of that. Yeah. So I, th- one thing I was taught early on, and, and this is right, don't, you can't think of our system as a one single legal system. We really have 51 legal systems. Each state has its own. And then the federal system, which sort of sits over all this. And I'll say with respect to both the Georgia case and the Colorado case, the feds can charge as well. There is no prohibition. You may think double jeopardy. The Supreme Court actually just held a couple of years ago. It's not double jeopardy if the state charges and then the feds charge the exact same person for the exact same conduct only under federal law. So in Georgia, they can charge federal hate crimes as well. Um, they, you know, whether there's a federal murder, you need a sort of federal hook for it to be a murder, which I'm not sure there is. But if it's a hate crime, the feds can charge it as well. Same thing in Colorado. Now, in Colorado, this individual is charged with 10 murders. It's pretty clear he made his first appearance today. They're going to argue not guilty by reason of insanity. Okay. And people get very upset when they hear that. Let me explain what that is and is not because people, there's a notion out there that people can walk if they claim they're insane. That's not quite true. First of all, if you claim you're not guilty by reason of insanity, even if you succeed, you don't get released. You get released to the custody of your state department of health where you get held in essentially a psychiatric ward for essentially the rest of your life. So it's not like we're releasing these people back into the world. It's also a very difficult defense to succeed on. Um, It's made a lot less often than people think. It's almost impossible to fake it. And even if you do make this defense, you're essentially arguing, my client was so far gone, he didn't even understand the difference between wrong and right. He didn't even understand the significance of his actions. And I've seen different statistics quoted all over the place, but everyone seems to agree that it's somewhere well below 50 percent of the time people try to raise that. They they succeed. Seems to be most estimates state by state come in around 25 percent of people who even try that defense succeed. And even if it does succeed, like I said, he's going to a psych ward. He's not being released back into the public. So, look. There's still a lot of questions, though, unanswered about Colorado. The prosecutors and cops have have to answer. What was his motive? Why did he pick this spot? Right. It was a half hour away from his home. Why did he pick that supermarket? How did he get the gun? Was anyone else in on it or did anyone else provide him with the weapons? Um, You know, they need to look at his social media. They need to get into his email accounts, see if there's any were any um, sort of you know, indicators that this was coming. He's charged with murder. He's going to, he's never going to get out of jail, but the families, you owe it to the families. You owe it to the victims. Um, As somebody who's tried murder cases, you owe them as many answers as you can possibly give them. Before Nick jumps in here, um, I wanted to ask you about something because, uh, and the Boulder one's a little bit personal for me. My, my wife was a friend of hers from high school, lives in that area. A lot of people were asking him if he was okay because he shops at that supermarket. So, Mm. Um, but um, you meant you touched on something here, and Nick asked you about the law enforcement official that that read out that statement. How tough is that uh, on a prosecutor, or even knowing that that the defense could use that in in court, saying, "Look, even the person in charge of the police department read a statement. They saw his mental framing. Uh, he is not this type of person. He had a bad day." Like, how tough is that on a prosecutor? Uh, yeah, that's one of those things that makes you groan as a prosecutor. I mean. You know, look, when you're a prosecutor, the main your main partners that you work with are the cops, whether it's the FBI, the state police, what have you. Ideally, you will get your story straight, not your story. That's not the right way to phrase it. That suggests that you're falsifying something. But ideally, you would agree to approach something in the same way and you would control the public relations. You wouldn't have people just going out there. And um, ultimately, it, it was it was a ridiculous thing for the cop to say in the Colorado case. I'm sorry, in the Georgia case, the he had a bad day thing. Um, It's ridiculous. It's unclear whether he was just 
trying to summarize what the victim had said. Excuse me. I said that wrong. Whether he was trying to summarize what the defendant had said or putting his own spin on it. Either way, it was a dreadful idea, a ridiculous thing to repeat into the camera. It sounded to me like the cop was making excuses for the defendant, which as a prosecutor, I would have a major, major problem with an objection to. Um, usually the cops I all dealt with were perfectly fine with allowing us, the prosecutors, to control the public relations, the, the public communications end of it. I think this is a good reason why. Yeah, the defense lawyer, um, look, ultimately he had a bad day is not going to get him anywhere in court. Um, but, you know, it's just a terrible look in terms of public confidence in law enforcement to have a cop out there spewing that kind of BS. You mentioned earlier, we talked about the difference of, and I really like that point about 51 different jurisdictions yeah. as, a, as a result of the lawmaking, thinking about that from a federal level. Mm-hmm. You know, Ellie, when we think about, you know, department, the Department of Justice now, you know, as it's about to, you know, now Merrick Garland steps in as the new attorney general, what do you see being the shift and the opportunity for the Department of Justice to become, to restore itself to becoming less apolitical as we've seen it um, from yeah. the re- previous administration under William Barr? Yeah. So this is this is the topic of my book that I have written and is coming out in July. Um, I want people to understand that what we saw over the last four years with Donald Trump and in particular, the last two with Bill Barr is completely unacceptable. It is completely not what the Justice Department is about. DOJ, I was raised, you know, not born there, but I was raised there, born there as a prosecutor. And I was always taught, and the history of DOJ is that DOJ is different. It, you know, it's the only federal agency that's name itself is an ideal, an aspiration, right? It's not treasury or agriculture, it is justice. And that's for a reason because DOJ, more than any of the other federal departments, needs to be apolitical, non political. Why? Because it is so dangerous to inject politics into prosecution or prosecution into politics. That is the fundamental, the number one fundamental principle at DOJ. We don't do politics here. Now, let me be clear what I mean. Each administration that comes in, Clinton to Bush to to Obama, can and does, and it's perfectly fine to have their own policy priorities. Uh, You know, different administrations may want to focus on opiates or child pornography or drug trafficking or terrorism, what have you. Totally fine. What is unacceptable is for DOJ to become an arm of protecting the president, protecting his allies, or even worse, going after his perceived enemies. And Bill Barr just was all in from before day one for using DOJ to protect Donald Trump, to protect Donald Trump's cronies, and and to push Donald Trump's false, nonsense, public, political agenda. Um, the, the, you know, I can give you examples, but everything from lying to the public about what Robert Mueller had found and essentially allowing Trump to skate on the Mueller report, intervening in unprecedented ways to let off the president's buddies, Michael Flynn, Roger Stone, easy, um, firing the boss of my old office, the Southern District of New York, and lying to the public about that. And most recently, lying to the public several times in the run up to the election saying there's this massive potential for voter fraud. He was very much, Bill Barr is very much culpable in the big lie that led to January 6th. After the fact, Bill Barr said that was horrible what happened on January 6th, but too late, sorry. When you spend months out there in front of Congress, on CNN, out there claiming that there's going to be a a potential for massive voter fraud, you're part of the problem. You caused it. So DOJ has been badly damaged in terms of its independence and its credibility, by the way, to have an AG who lied as many times and as obviously as Bill Barr did is just an outrage. The one thing that is the most important thing you have as a prosecutor is your credibility. You lose that, you're done. Can DOJ bounce back? Absolutely. The thing about DOJ is it really is driven by the everyday women and men who I used to be one of who who make the cases on the front lines. And most of them won't change. Most of them have continued to do their jobs, keep their head down, heads down and do their jobs throughout the Trump bar administration. And they'll continue to do that now. I think the new leadership is much stronger. Merrick Garland, I think, has shown much more of an appreciation for the need for independence. Also, importantly, Bill Barr, one of the central theses of my book, Bill Barr is a pretender. 
Bill Barr was never a real prosecutor. He was attorney general in the early 90s. He's actually one of two people ever to be attorney general of the United States twice. But the guy never tried a case. He never stepped foot in a courtroom. He doesn't know what it means to be a prosecutor. He doesn't know what it means to have to deal with defendants, witnesses, victims, cops, judges, defense lawyers. He just sits in his suite in D.C. and sort of, you know, hands out decrees. Contrast that to the prior AGs who came before him. Republican and Democrat alike, Michael Mukasey, Republican appointee, Eric Holder, Loretta Lynch, Democratic appointees, even Jeff Sessions, who I think was a terrible AG, had been a prosecutor. And Merrick Garland is sort of the platonic ideal of the career prosecutor. The guy came up through DOJ. He worked uh, on the line. He supervised the biggest cases you can you can have the Oklahoma City bombing case, the Atlanta Olympic bombing case. So it will be a big change for DOJ to get back its credibility, to get back its independence and to get someone who's someone I consider a real prosecutor back in the AG's chair. Let's stay on D.C. for a moment, because what happened on January 6th in our nation's capital was terrible. And obviously now <clears throat> the people that have been arrested by the FBI, I saw you on yesterday on CNN discussing about the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys and the potential conspiracy charges that could be brought against some of the people um, on January 6th. Let's talk a little bit about some of those cases. Uh, if you could shed some light on the developments about that with the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys, what what that means for from a prosecutorial lens. But also, you know, you talked about it, the, the, the tweets of the former president, the speeches on January 6th. How much of that is introduced into evidence Mm-hmm. prosecution wise and defense wise, because we've seen some clients say, hey, the president told me to be there on January 6th. This was arranged by him. I was just following orders. How much? How, let's go into all of that, if you could. Yeah. So thus far, DOJ has charged over 300 people uh, in connection with January 6th. They've told us more to come. They're just now starting to get into what I consider the heavier stuff, right? They've charged a bunch of people with unlawful entry into the Capitol and destruction of property, you know, significant crimes, theft of property. Some people took laptops or documents. The big ones though are going to be the conspiracy and the sedition charges. And these are two different topics. We just saw this week the first really major conspiracy charge. Now, people hear this phrase conspiracy and they think, oh, it must mean backroom plotting and, and detailed premeditation. All a conspiracy is, is an agreement between two people to commit a crime. Every drug deal, you know, A sells to B, that's a conspiracy because those two people, even if they didn't say it out loud, when, you know, that's an agreement, it's a meeting of the minds. So any crime that really involves two or more people working together is a conspiracy. What's interesting, though, is now we're seeing those conspiracy charges start starting to tie together these domestic groups. We're seeing conspiracies charging Oath Keepers, Proud Boys, other groups. And we're starting to see that those groups are linking, that the Oath Keepers were working with and planning with the Proud Boys in advance of January 6th. The conspiracy charge is going to allow prosecutors to give juries the full picture of what happened on January 6th. Get into the details. Who's who? Who was communicating? Who were the leaders? How were they financed? That kind of thing. And it's going to cause these guys to start flipping on each other. They're going to start cooperating. They're going to start... and. and A lot of defendants cooperate in the federal system because there's an awful lot of pressure when you get charged federally. And when you cooperate, you have to give up everything you know about everybody. I cooperated. That's how I made cases, especially against the mafia, by flipping guys. You know, they bring you inside the organization. Um, What's interesting is we're seeing a lot of people, we're seeing a lot of evidence that these folks did what they did because they believed or understood that's what Donald Trump wanted them to do. And Mike, you alluded to this. There's now new evidence that some of these domestic groups in their communication said, we'll be wild, we'll be wild. I mean, that's an exact echo of Donald Trump's tweets. Remember, Donald Trump sent, I think it's five or six tweets in advance of that rally, say, be there January 6th. And one of them, the most infamous one, Trump said, be there, we'll be wild, right? And they pick up on his rhetoric and he knows how to push them, I think. You know, he knows what buttons to push. He's always been good at the sort of dog whistle, wink and a nod, you know what I really mean kind of thing. Um, And I think that's damaging for Donald Trump, certainly politically. It played into the impeachment. I thought it was powerful evidence at the impeachment that his words and actions directly contributed to what happened on January 6th. It's not going to be a legal defense saying, I thought the president wanted me to do it. Even if it's true, you don't. the president doesn't get to just say, you 
go ahead and break the law. That's fine. That's not how our system works, right? President can't have that prospective pardons and say, hey, go ahead. You raid the Capitol. I'll take care of it. I mean, right. sorry. Like, look, the president's powerful, but it doesn't mean he gets to just on the spot override our laws. So it's not going to go anywhere for these defendants. Um, but they'll start flipping on each other. They'll start pleading guilty. And uh, look, we're still going to see murder charges, I believe, if the if the evidence backs it up on Officer Sicknick. Um, the Capitol police officer who was, who died during the attack. And I think they're just waiting on that autopsy to make the connection between the bear spray attack and his death. I think we're going to see sedition charges, which are very rare and basically mean that the defendants tried to overthrow the government of the United States, but there's let that's very dramatic. There's less dramatic versions too. If you can show the defendants tried to interfere with a governmental function here, the counting of the electoral votes that counts as sedition. If you show that the defendants, without authorization, took over federal property, the Capitol. They physically took, we saw it. It was on CNN. Um, that too is sedition. So I think we're going to start to see sedition charges as well. When we think about cases, you know, another one that comes to mind actually is the case involving Derek Chauvin. And you know, right. when we think about the murder of George Floyd, right now we're still in that process of jury selection. We're moving forward, but just taking us through from a prosecutorial lens, yeah. um, what is happening in that trial? And I'm going to ask a second part question up front. What what often happens in these trials? Because it seems if we're betting people, and I, you know, I bet occasionally, I'm going to bet that he's not going to face prison for this. Huh. Um, and that seems to be, and that's the cynic in me. I and think it's a cynical look, but it's also a lot of people feel that way. Yep. Um, you know, unfortunately. I understand that. There's, there's, and I know Bill Maher has talked about this a lot about the evidence of recent convictions of police officers, but yeah. it's still over a long period of time. I, I, I kind of agree with Nick, and I'm not, you know, yeah. obviously I have my, 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 my leanings on that. So I agree with the fact, first of all, let's just take any trial. I've done a lot of trials. Anyone who tells you, you know, a conviction is certain doesn't know what they're talking about. I've seen juries do things that shocked me both ways. Multiply that when it's a cop case, because as you said, cops, look, cops do have a certain amount of legal authority to use force that a normal person doesn't have. Now, that often gets used as a defense for cases that may involve excessive force, but it's harder because a cop always has a built in defense that you or I might not have of I was doing my job. I was struggling with this person. Also, there's a natural, I think, hesitancy to to convict cops because you're raised from an early age to see cops as these authority figures and then multiply that again when it's a race case. And there's no question this is a case involving race. So to me, almost no outcome here would shock me. Um, I think an acquittal not guilty across the board would shock me. I think it would shock a lot of people. But then again, as you know, there is a history of shocking police acquittals. Um, let me first lay out what how this works, because I think some people don't, are a little confused about the charges. There's three charges in this case, okay? Top, middle, bottom. The most serious charge is a second degree murder. The prosecutors have to show that Derek Chauvin intentionally assaulted George Floyd and that caused his death. It's a 40 year max. That's the most serious charge. The middle charge, which actually the judge threw out of the case and then the appeals court said, no, you have to include it, is a third degree murder, which is called a depraved mind murder. Again, this is, we talk 51 systems. I, I'm now an expert in Minnesota law. Um, depraved mind murder means you knew that it was outrageously dangerous to do what you did and you went ahead and did it anyway and someone died as a result. The classic example is like shooting into a crowd. Maybe you're not saying I'm trying to kill that guy. You just do something absolutely, you know, wildly dangerous, obviously dangerous, and you do it anyway and someone dies. And then the lowest one is manslaughter, um, which is just negligent, just acted in, a, you know, without due care, basically. The jury can come back with any combination of guilty or not guilty. They can say guilty in all three. They can say not guilty on all three. They can say guilty on one and three, but not two. Guilty on two, but not one. I mean, you know, each one, each count stands alone. The other thing is the jury has to be unanimous. 12-0 to convict, 12-0 to acquit. Anything else is a hung jury. And I've had all three of those outcomes, conviction, acquittal, and hung juries. A hung jury technically is like a draw in that you can retry the case, but the reality is it's a loss for the prosecution and it's a win for the defense. And if there's a hung jury here, it will be very much taken almost as the same as an acquittal. So, and it's hard, right? Because 
in a supercharged case like this, where there's policing at play, there's race at play, you're going to have to get all 12 people together to unanimously say guilty or not guilty to have a verdict. Now, uh, the jury, the jury is really interesting to me in this case. We have the jury now. Hennepin County, where Minneapolis is located, is 13%, 13.6% African-American population. It is the most racially diverse case in the state of Minnesota. There was a motion early on to move the case to another county. Twice the defense tried to do that. The judge did the right thing and said, no way. If he moved it to another county, it would have been a far less racially diverse jury pool. It would have been not the county where the crime occurred. I'm, I'm very glad that the judge did not move that case. That would have been uh, a real miscarriage of justice. The way it played out, though, sometimes who ends up in your jury is just a matter of the luck of the draw. You have a case, you have a, a county with 13 percent African-Americans. You can end up with none on your jury. I mean, just mathematically, it all happens sometimes. Right. The way this jury ended up, we have tw we have 15 jurors, but three of them are alternate. So they're only going to come into play if one of the first 12 gets sick or has to be removed of the 12. Four of them are black. And I, I don't say African-American because some of them are not African-American. They identified as black. And two of them are mixed race. And this is according to the jurors' own self-identifications in court. So if you do the math there, half the jury is black or mixed race. One third of the jury is black. That is substantially more racially diverse than Hennepin County itself. And I think that's, I'll say unequivocally, that's a good thing. I'm not talking about what the ultimate outcome is. I, I don't know how people are going to vote. I mean, in terms of the public looking at this verdict and accept, ultimately seeing it as legitimate and the, and the result of a reasonable and fair process. Because if we had the opposite, if the cards fell and the jury notices fell in a way where this jury had no black jurors or one black juror, there would be a real problem, understandably, with the public acceptance of the legitimacy of this verdict. So we have a racially diverse jury, much more racially diverse than you would have expected. Um, and it's a young jury. Um, 10 of the 15 total jurors are in there are below 50. In my experience, jurors usually tend to be older people because retirees are more able to sit on juries because they don't come in with the excuses, right? And I'm a doctor. I have to do my rounds. I'm a teacher. I have my class, right? So you tend to get more retirees. In this case, you have more younger people. I'll, I guess I'll leave it up to you and the audience to decide who that helps or hurts. Um, so we have a jury. And when, one last interesting thing to me about the jury is this. When you're picking a jury, both sides, the prosecution and the defense, get a certain number of what we call peremptory strikes, meaning you can remove jurors you do not like. You can't remove them for racial reasons or other, you know, gender, religion, that kind of thing, other constitutionally protected reasons. In this case, both sides left peremptory challenges on the table. The defense was given 18, meaning you can remove 18 jurors and they remove 14. But four of them, they said, we're done, we're good. And the prosecution left a few on the board as well. So that tells me both sides are satisfied with the jury. And I think that's a good thing. I think what you want is a jury that both sides look at and say, we can live with that jury. We believe they can be impartial. We believe they can judge this case only on the evidence in the courtroom and not what they're seeing on TV. You know, I, I was going to pivot, but I want to stay on this for a second because take us through uh, the mentality of a big case, right? We all saw mm -hmm. Marsha Clark and what happened and the magnitude of that trial and yeah. the OJ case, right? Yeah. But what is it like inside that room getting prepared and knowing that you have to go against, like this is going to be, this may be OJ 2.0, this trial may be that second coming where there's so much spotlight and attention on it. How tough is it to get ready as a prosecution knowing that that's the backdrop? Yeah, um, th the spotlight is going to be even brighter because this case is being televised, which does not usually happen in the state of Minnesota. But the judge ruled that there was so much public attention. By the way, the prosecutors, interestingly, objected to that. They didn't want cameras in the courtroom, but the judge is allowing it. Um, I've tried high profile cases, pa pa cases that were you know against well-known mob figures covered in the New York media, but nothing to compare to this. I mean, this is international news and stakes. I think all you can do is as a prosecutor, and this is probably why they objected to the cameras, you want as little drama as possible. You want this to be all about the facts. You want this to be clean. You don't want to have, God forbid, you get a conviction, but there's some problem with the case and it gets reversed on appeal. You know, 
no drama, just the facts. That is your mantra if you're trying this case as the prosecutor. As the defense, look, defense lawyers sometimes try to use these situations, and I don't mean this as a criticism, to their client's advantage. If you can get out in the media and put out sound bites or talking points that you think will help your client, whether your client is John Gotti or OJ Simpson or Derek Chauvin, defense lawyers will do that. Now, they've played it fairly modest so far, Chauvin's lawyers. It seems to me like everyone's sort of, all the players here, the, the lawyers and the judges and the judge understand that the whole world is watching. It's really important that we do this carefully and right and that we're not, this doesn't become a circus, right? And so I think as a prosecutor, um, you're happy with that. You don't want a defense lawyer grandstanding and going around and doing the rounds on TV in the middle of trial. Um, in fact, the biggest um, wave so far was the fault of the city of Minneapolis, which decided to announce in the middle of jury selection that they'd agreed to pay $27 million to George Floyd's family as a settlement. Um, I'm not, I have no opinion on the settlement itself. That's between the parties. But to announce that publicly in the middle of jury selection was outrageous. The judge was furious. They lost jurors as a result of that. Um, it complicated the whole process. And of course they knew, of course the city of Minneapolis knew. The prosecutors apologize, essentially apologized for it. They said, look, judge, we don't control that. That's not us. Um, I suspect somebody in the city of Minneapolis thought they were maybe doing the prosecutors a favor by, because look, it certainly suggests that he's liable, that Chauvin's liable or guilty, but the prosecutor's reaction was very clearly, no, thank you. Like, you know, that you're not helping anybody by announcing that. So I hope for everybody's sake that we don't have that kind of sort of external unforeseen, um, you know, interruption thrown into this. I really just hope that it's a clean process. I, I hope, um, look, from what I know, I, I think Chauvin um, committed crimes um, and I think should be convicted. And um, I hope that, but, but I don't root for an outcome. What I root for is a clean, fair process that people accept as legitimate. On the subject of grandstanding, we look at now the case involving Sidney Powell, the lawsuit that's coming up. A defense that's being offered by her is the the classic, I didn't mean it seriously <laughs> defense, which for listeners, that's not the first time we've heard that. If any of you remember, in 2017, Alex Jones had said something similar. The defense, the defense had put forward the, he's playing a persona. Right. And Ellie, my question to you is, is this is that a viable legal strategy to basically put forward the, the you all know I didn't mean that by the way that's something yeah. you were referring to earlier as a similar strategy we've seen as it involves January sixth and influence of yeah. social media and, and uh, Trump. Uh, no, this is not going to help Sidney Powell at all. First, first things first. Now Sidney Powell, one of the leading purveyors of the election fraud theory conspiracy, has admitted that she is a big fraud and that her whole election fraud uh, story itself was a big fraud. I mean, think about it. She was one of the front edge people out there filing lawsuits, doing press conferences. People were quoting her, retweeting her. She was a hero of the rigged election movement. And now she's come out and said, not only was I a fraud, but I was such a ridiculous fraud that no reasonable person would have believed me. It is as crazy as it sounds. And here's the thing. Other people have tried this. You said Alex Jones, you know, to some extent, Fox News has tried saying this about Tucker Carlson. I'm not sure it's going to hold up in those contexts because you can't make a statement of fact. These machines were hacked by Venezuela or whatever. And then just say, oh, no, I meant that as an opinion. That's not what an opinion is. Also, but at least those folks are media in the media, right? And they have some little basis to argue, well, it, he's an opinionated guy. He's doing a performance. It's entertainment. Sidney Powell was doing none of those things. Sidney Powell was acting as a lawyer, filing legal motions, filing lawsuits. And by the way, not trivially, not as a joke, she was trying to overturn the damn election, right? So Sidney Powell was deadly serious. And if you need any further proof of that, look at January 6th. I mean, hundreds of or thousands of people, really millions of people across the country believe, still believe to this day that the election was stolen. And even I'm sure Sidney Powell admitting that it was all a lie, a ridiculous lie, probably won't change, um, won't, probably won't change too many minds. So the, the, the 
what what's so telling to me is what Sidney Powell is trying to do is hide behind the protections that are given to a very certain kind of speech, which is parody or satire, right? Our law says if something is obviously intended as parody or satire, and it goes back to the old like, you know, political cartoons they were doing in the 1700s, you can't sue that person for defamation. For example, if they did a sketch on Saturday Night Live where Kate McKinnon came out and said, oh, the, the whole election was stolen by Venezuelan hackers, you and I, we would all recognize that's parody, that's comedy. They don't mean that seriously. Same thing with The Onion or Mad Magazine or, or what was it, Ruckers? There was a paper like that. The media. Oh, the mug, the mug the media, rat or something Oh, the like mug that. rat, right, mug exactly. Rat, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We all recognize this is parody. The fact that Sidney Powell, a lawyer, is saying, please group me in with The Onion, please group me in with Saturday Night Live, A, tells you a lot about her, B, not going not gonna to fly because she was dead serious when she said, said and did all of these things. Let's stay on uh, the big lie and January 6th and everything that happened with the election fraud because there's so much uh, lawsuits being thrown around. And obviously today on Capitol Hill, at the time of this recording, we had some of the big tech guys up there talking about misinformation, yeah. Parler suing Amazon, saying that they didn't contribute to January 6th. What do you make from a legislation standpoint that needs to be done to either rein in social media or uh, what do you think will come out of all of these hearings on Capitol Hill? Will everything stay the same? Hey, we have a privacy policy. You violate it. We cancel your account. Is anything ever going to change with the way social media is trying to rein in some of this misinformation? So oddly, this may be a bit of a bipartisan agreement issue. Um, the, the phrase you'll hear is section 230. You'll hear Donald Trump used to rail ab about, oh, I hate 230. We got to change 230. In a nutshell, what section 230 did, and this was passed in the very, very early days of, of the internet, is a rule that says essentially a, a website, a, a social media type website, or, you know, back in the old days, a chat room. But for now, let's think about, let's use, um, let's use Facebook as an example. Facebook is, a platform, not a publisher, meaning Facebook is like, if you think back to college, remember the, they had a big cork board in each dorm, right? And you could pin up your notices, your flyers. Facebook, the law says, is essentially like that cork board. They're not a publisher, so they're not responsible. You don't hold the cork board responsible for what gets put up on it. And so essentially, the law says you can't sue Facebook for defamation if someone like Sidney Powell starts putting nonsense, defamatory nonsense on your platform. The argument for Section 230 is the internet, social media, networking sites would not exist. They would be sued into oblivion immediately, right? The argument, the counter argument, I guess, is, well, maybe that's a good thing because maybe that would incentivize them to police what goes up on their sites a little better because if Facebook feels like it can never get sued, why are they going to care? Why are they going to clean up disinformation, misinformation? If they feel like they could be sued into oblivion, then they have a lot of reason to sort of police and control what goes up on their website. You know, the counter argument. So th that's, those are the arguments for and against 230. You're trying to, to protect and preserve the right of these companies to run their public platforms versus incentivizing them. And then there's this debate about should, you know, does Twitter, let me start with this. Does Twitter have the right to, to throw off Donald Trump, to, to suspend him? Absolutely. Not First Amendment. Everyone goes, First Amendment, First Amendment. I have First Amendment rights. No, that's a private entity. The First Amendment says, what's the very first word of the First Amendment? Congress. Congress shall make no law. It only means the government cannot stop you. Twitter, you know, look, if we had to start all over again, you may think about does something like Twitter or Facebook in some respect has more power than a lot of governmental entities. but Alas, they are private enterprises. So, you know, look, liberals or I would, you know, liberals and Democrats um, worry. And I think, well, not just liberals and Democrats, but one concern about social media is it's become such a potent, virulent platform for misinformation, dangerous misinformation, for hatred, for racial hatred, for political lies, for Russian and foreign disinformation. Conservatives um, claim that they're being picked on and discriminated against and that, you know, that the search results are engineered against them. And, um, you know, and why are they kicking off Donald Trump and, and the, my pillow guy and not, you know, 
Democratic figures. So both sides sort of have a beef um, with, you know, with both with, with these kind of entities. The question is, how can Congress or how can we legally give these sites enough incentive, financial incentive, because that's what they respond to, to make sure they're not pushing disinformation um, without, you know, putting them in a position where they're just going to be immediately sued into into oblivion. Some of these slowly, too slowly, these websites are starting to police themselves a little more. Right. Facebook is doing, you know, too little, too late, but better something than nothing, I suppose. And, you know, the other websites, I think eventually they're going to get to a point where they're loot. Right. A lot of people are off Facebook now because they just don't believe in it. And it's too, you know, they don't like what it, what it does, what it stands for and the misinformation. So when they start feeling it on their bottom line, they're That's when they're going to respond. Ellie, you've been fantastic today, my friend. I would expect nothing less from a Rutgers man. Uh, you can check out Ellie every time. He's a CNN legal analyst, a former federal prosecutor. Go check out that podcast, Third Degree. You want to learn all the legal news of the week. And I love that he has a segment on with some legal students uh, once a yeah. week. So Ellie, appreciate the time you've given us today, my friend. All the best to you and continued success, sir. Mike, Nick, thank you for having me. Love what you guys do. Keep it up. All right. That was Ellie Honig. As we mentioned, former federal prosecutor, a current legal analyst at CNN. He's got that book coming out in July about the DOJ, but also check out his podcast, Third Degree, available wherever you get your podcast. You want to find out about all the legal news that's going on. And really, you know, uh, Nick, Ellie touched on so much there uh, of all the different legal news that's coming out. Right. And especially with the shootings that's happened, what's happening on January 6th, um, everything with the lawsuits on big tech. Uh, what'd you make of Ellie and, and the conversation overall? And also, you know, the, the legal profession, he, he let you in a little bit about how tough it is from a prosecution standpoint when you have such a high profile case, knowing that, you know, you can't mess this up. You know, we've got to be coordinated here. Yeah. I mean, that was for our listeners and and viewers. That was basically a dummy's guide to the American legal system. Like if you've been trying to get all these books to try to figure out the intricacies of all Listen to this show. Listen to the show. Watch these clips because Ali was fantastic. He took us through up and down what it what it means to understand law at a state level and at a federal level. And at the same time, just took us through all the headlines. You know, to, you know, for this show, we thought about a lot of just some of the major stories, you know, that the they're just showing they're showing up. And, you know, from a legal standpoint, how do we break it down? How do we make sense? I, you know, I don't want to speak for you here, but you know, I, I continue to learn something about the American legal system. And similar to the episode that we had, um, our you know second or third episode, you know, that Dave Harback and they come on to to talk yeah. about, you know, after the election, the you know, lawsuits and stuff about that. Um, Ali just brings that to a whole new level, you know, helping us to understand jury selection. You know, we spent a good time talking about the the, the Derek, you know, the Derek Chauvin um, case, you know, the, for the murder of George Floyd. And I mean, we know jury selection is going on, but Ellie during that segment takes us really through where we are with the jury pool, how we arrived here, what are going to be the different charges. And it's an excellent way to understand what's going on in the headlines because reading the articles isn't enough. You do need to connect with someone who does know what they're talking about in the legal field. And, and Ellie brought that tonight. You know, it's, it's funny. I think back to, I went to one time a bachelor party in New Orleans and a friend of mine who's an attorney said, hey, no way. Yeah, it's a segue because he's an attorney and said, nobody get arrested because this is New Orleans and I don't know Louisiana law. And he talked about that, Ellie did, right? We've got 51 different legal systems, if you count Puerto Rico, obviously, and, and D.C. as well. If it ever becomes a state, you'll have 52. But there's there's every state has its own laws. And look, he told you about Minnesota, where the Derek Chauvin case is. Uh, Colorado, where this case is about the shootings, Atlanta, those are three different states, three different sets of laws um, as it pertains to those cases and the murders that happen in those cases. Like there's just so much. I'm so glad he came on tonight to break that down. Uh, speaking of shows you can listen to and break down. I, that's a terrible segue, but we're still going to use it anyway. Uh, for the YouTube watchers, we're Nick, yeah, we're family. Nick's pointing down, smashing the subscribe button, hit subscribe. Audio platforms, you know them by now, folks. Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts. Leave us a five-star review and comment, please. And also on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, at Can We Please Talk Podcast. Check us out in all the social clips and the episodes like Ellie's and more original content from us. As always, I'm Mike Leon. And if you give us less than five stars, I'm going to look at you funny and I'm Nick Severi. That's right. And he's got his blazer on, folks. We'll see you next time.